And we are live. Thank you for tuning in to the Preterist Power Hour, being here with us for yet again another hour of power. Uh, this is a ministry provided to you through the Power of Preterism Network, which you can learn more about by visiting powerofpreterism.com. Uh, in brief, I will say that the goal of the Power of Preterism Network is to provide clarity, healing, and strategy, and being on the front lines of reformation and revival in our day and age. We've obviously come to see a lot of that reformation and revival being provided through the hermeneutic of preterism. So that's why we focus a lot on it, not intending to be fanatics, but intend, uh, intending to be those that aim for clarity, healing, and strategy in better understanding the Bible. So uh, I hope our time will be exactly that for you this morning. We tend to call our Mondays Mind Dump Monday, so we're going to throw a lot at you, hopefully give you some resources to uh, seek, search, study, and prove to the best of your ability, um, hopefully provide some clarity maybe in areas that any of us or those that are tuned in uh, might be searching for that clarity, uh, and being and providing healing, healing in our fellowship together, uh, knowing that we're not alone in our journey of uh, understanding preterism, uh, maybe uh, knowing that we're not alone in our questions in the different areas that maybe this preterist hermeneutic has taken us, and strategizing how we might better help others understand these things as well. So uh, that's the goal this morning. I get to be your host. I'm Mike Miano. I serve as the director of the Power of Preterism Network. Some of you might know I also serve as the pastor at the Blue Point Bible Church. I'll be mentioning some resources in that regard this morning. So I hope you might be tuned into both of those ministries and uh, that each of those ministries encourage you to have what I like to call a zeal empowered by knowledge. Let's go ahead and start out our hour of power, if you will, uh, with a moment of prayer and praise, and then we'll jump right into in on some Mind Dump Monday details. Let's pray. Mighty God, we do thank you. You truly are a faithful, merciful, gracious, loving, providing God. You are sovereign, Lord, and providential in so many regards, Lord, in the ways that we can testify this morning or this afternoon, uh, Lord, and also, of course, uh, in ways that go beyond our expression. We thank you. We praise you. We ask that you do provide that clarity, healing, and strategy this morning, that we might have an answer for the hope that we have, Lord, uh, that we might encourage others to look to you, to see the light, Lord, and that all of this would cause us to praise you for giving us eyes to see and ears to hear. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, it's been a it's been a while. Uh, many of you know. Uh, just to kind of jump in on the you know my personal life here, I just uh, had a baby. Uh, you know, I didn't have the baby, but my beautiful wife did. And uh, you know, I have the privilege of caring, nurturing, and and raising up this uh, child. And uh, I'll tell you, the excitement is uh, it leaves me without words. It leaves me, let's say, a bit empty minded. So Mind Dump Monday for me could be a bit strange because I'm all over the place in my thoughts, as I believe it should be. Interesting thing I shared yesterday at the Blue Point Bible Church uh, was about hope and hope fulfilled. Uh, here I was for nine months hoping for the baby to come. And then it was even more exciting as it was soon. The baby's going to come soon. And then we were at the hospital and the baby came. And now I find myself hopeless. Most of you probably see that as silly, right? Because I don't see myself as hopeless. Actually, now my hope's been fulfilled. My baby's here. And now I'm hoping that the baby will be raised upright, will grow up well, will be healthy, uh, will continue to bless others as she is blessed, as she grows through this life. Prayerfully, you see the correlation to what we're talking about. Our hope has been fulfilled. That doesn't leave us hopeless. That matter of fact, that challenges us to have new hopes for uh, what we might do with the manifold wisdom of God. That was the goal. The goal of the ages was what? That his people would know, his, would have knowledge of him and would make that knowledge known. If we journey through the biblical narrative, we see uh, Old Covenant Israel, they lacked the knowledge of God. And because of that, they were destroyed. In the first century, we had people that had a zeal for God, but that zeal was based upon tradition rather than the true knowledge of God. And uh, here we praise God that we now have the knowledge of God, the wisdom of God. And how beautiful is that? And I see Dallas had uh, mentioned something in the comments there. Wow, the hope of the father for his church his baby. Exactly. And I'm glad to see that that did not fall on deaf ears. And I do want to encourage folks, if you uh, go to the Blue Point Bible Church website, if you go to my personal blog site, Miano Gone Wild, I've been providing links to the Blue Point Bible Church sermon series, 
crazy Corinthians, and also providing my note, my notes. Just yesterday, I found myself preaching a part six going through First Corinthians chapter 15. And as preterists, you know, that's the uh, big deal to us, uh, what's going on there in First Corinthians 15. It should be a big deal to all of us as Christians, what's going on there in First Corinthians chapter 15. So it's surely been a blessing to lean in on uh, what we're saying about the resurrection of the dead ones. And uh, hopefully I've been offering up some uh, thoughts that have been challenging, not only the congregation at the Blue Point Bible Church, but those of you that tune in to our resources. So uh, again, I mentioned two things there, my exhortation I gave yesterday, and then also the sermon. I'll be sharing that link. Hopefully you'll be encouraged. That might be one of my Mind Dump Monday thoughts. However, I want to take you back a bit. Um, we've been really laboring and talking about Gary DeMar lately, laboring and listening to his podcasts, whether it's the Gary DeMar podcast or uh, Biblical Hermeneutics and or Biblical Theology and Covenant Hermeneutics, the podcast with, uh, with Gary DeMar and Kim Bur Burgess. Uh, you know, again, great stuff. I've really appreciated what these men have put forth. I'm still journeying my way through those podcasts. However, there's been some really interesting stuff happening in that conversation. Uh, one of the things was uh, going back, well, let's just take ourselves back a bit here. Uh, we know that uh, about two, three months ago now, maybe, maybe less, there was this indictment, if you will, against Gary DeMar, where uh, he's been challenged to answer three questions, basically to prove that he's not succumbed to full preterism. So, uh, you know, he did not answer the questions adequately for those that made the charge. And uh, Gary, in my estimation, did a very honest and strategic thing where he said, let's help people understand why it is they believe what they believe, and then also help them understand what we're getting at, and maybe give you some tools for your toolbox in better seeking, searching, and studying the truth. So, uh, so those are the two podcasts that, you know, I've had on my sort of head, you know, my, uh, my tabs, there we go, uh, here on my computer, and I've been really listening and trying to follow the thought. So then uh, there's been a lot of conversa conversation that's developed out of uh, what's happening with Gary DeMar. Uh, one of those, interestingly enough, a couple weeks ago was an article written by Joel McDermott. Now, we've brought up Joel McDermott quite a bit here on this program. I've actually invited him to be one of our guests, and uh, he's put it on the shelf. He didn't say no, but he just said, you know, give me some time. And if you read his recent blog, you can sort of understand why. Joel is being honest himself and admitting that uh, he might have in years past come off as if he says full preterism is heresy. And he's now double backed on that and said, you know, I, I don't want to call full preterist heretics. I don't think that's the right attitude. And he said that, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the language, the arrogance, et cetera, that's on display is because there's this sort of full preterist panic uh, where, you know, oh, no, you can't go full preterist is sort of happening. And uh, there's not a lot of clarity. You know, what does it mean to be a full preterist? Many of you know this is something close to my heart, currently working on a book in that regard, Full Preterism, Proclaiming the Presence and Purpose of God. That's what we're hoping for, uh, that we believe that in the past, we can find fulfilled Bible prophecy, which helps us better proclaim the presence and purpose of God. So uh, how that's explained and what details are focused on tends to differ between different full preterists, sort of like Christianity. If you talk to five Christians about what the gospel is, what's the effect of the gospel, you might get five different responses. Similar, but different, because they're focusing, you know, as I hear people often say, sometimes to my uh, frustration, the Bible's a big book. Uh, well, you know, the Bible's full of books, yes, yeah, 66 books, which tends to make it a big book for many. However, the Bible is not exactly that big of a book. Uh, it's, you know, if you take your time and you're careful, you can get through it. It's not some sort of thing that we have to keep on the shelf and say, we might never understand it. We can, if you do the work, if you do what Kim Burgess has been calling biblical theology. Take your time. I like to call that narrative theology. Uh, take your time, go through the story, understand what it is you, you know, uh, sort of um, outline your narrative. I've done that. I've mentioned this. Uh, I did a debate or a discussion a couple of years ago where we outlined five parts of the Bible. And then we understood what we were saying about those five parts. Uh, I tend to think that's a good way of going about establishing a foundation and then asking yourself, well, if somebody brings up Bible prophecy, where does that fit within your outline? Uh, is it a part of the beginning? Does it have any connection to the beginning? Uh, is it about the end? Does the end correlate to the beginning and so forth? Uh, there's some great ways to go about that study. So I've really appreciated uh, what Gary DeMar and 
Kim Burgess, and now I've just mentioned Joel McDermott, the honesty that these men are fostering. Unfortunately, uh, as we just celebrated Holy Week a couple of weeks ago, we know that even when great things happen and honesty is on the scene, so to speak, light is there. Uh, there are those who do not like, the darkness does not like the light. Um, that, you know, unfortunately, when honesty is having its heyday, uh, we see many that oppose it. And unfortunately, our recent events with the, the preterist view uh, is not absence of that as well. So there are men such as Doug Wilson, who recently just posted a video uh, talking about Hymenaeus and uh, kind of mocking full preterism, full of arrogant thoughts, a very short video, about 12 minutes. Uh, I appreciate Dr. Don Preston, Zach Davis. Uh, they have leaned in and, and provided some responses to that videos. I'm also working on a response to that video where he talked about all 14 of the full preterists and you know why this is not so basically, if I might explain this simply, for years, the full preterist community has been urging, let's say, popular Bible teachers to see how important the hermeneutic of preterism truly is. And it's gone, you know, sort of ignored. Uh, I've reached out to James White, you know, a Dr. James White, I've made, a, you know, a frenemies, if you will, uh, that's friendly enemies uh, with uh, some of these folks that, uh, you know, over talking about preterism. And uh, this has happened for, for me, it's been a, more than a decade for some of the leaders that we, you know, the giants that we stand upon their shoulders, this has been happening for 20 plus, 30 plus years uh, of just the popular Bible community ignoring the hermeneutic of preterism, all the while using it to establish their own teachings, Doug Wilson being one of these people. And uh, if you go on YouTube, you can find Doug Wilson, put in or Google, YouTube, anything, put in full or put in preterism, Doug Wilson. Uh, interestingly enough, we posted a write-up from him going back to 1993 on the Power of Preterism WordPress site uh, that explain, you know, it shows him defending the hermeneutic of preterism back in 1993. However, over the years, uh, this has seemingly gone un, you know, dealt with. And, you know, the full preterists have kind of just been shoved out of rooms or, dare I say, tapped on shoulders and walked out of churches. And this has been the way people have dealt with this. So uh, now we're, we're seeing sort of change and, uh, you know, this is being highlighted. So Doug Wilson wants to say that the reason why for years it was going unnoticed and uncared for was because there was about 14 full preterists that are just fanatics and cannot get over it and want to always talk about it, bring it up at every end. Uh, so he says that now the reason why there's being strong indictments against Gary DeMar particularly is because Gary DeMar has a large following. So now it's become something of importance. Meanwhile, for 30 years, you know, folks have been laboring in this and trying to show how important it truly is. So, um, you know, a very mocking video, sort of disappointing from a man that has such a high regard in the Christian community. And uh, like I said, I'll be working on a response to that. I do encourage you to visit um, Don's response as well as Zach Davis's, which I'll share in our update this week. What I'm looking to do following our session today, as I'm excited to hear from some of you that are here with me live, is uh, put together a Mind Dump Monday blog that'll kind of catalogs different things we mentioned this morning. So I've already mentioned a couple. And uh, yeah, Don Preston, you know, just a, a couple other things I'll mention briefly here. Uh, Don Preston had a debate uh, a couple about Last week, he did a debate with an atheist. Uh, this was done on the Myth Vision uh, podcast, done on YouTube by Derek Lambert. And I have not had the opportunity, to be quite honest, I have not had the care uh, to watch the debate. Uh, however, you know, I appreciate Don Preston's efforts, and I look forward to leaning in on that a bit. So uh, I know I've mentioned uh, we've uploaded quite a bit of Tim Martin's sermons. Uh, I'm looking to upload some more of his sermons soon, uh, namely his sermon series on the gospel of Mark. So you can look forward to that. And uh, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, if I might just kind of express these last couple of thoughts, and then I'll unmute some mics, because I don't want to ramble too much. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, I have a lot going on uh, in my head. So uh, one thing I do want to mention here is uh, Kim, Berg Kim Burgess had said, uh, Burgess had said, that what we're not talking about is full stop preterism. Now, I don't really use that language. Uh, however, of course, I don't believe full preterism is full stop. Hopefully, you caught my analogy earlier about giving birth to a child, bringing a child into the world, uh, the hope for the child to come into the world, and then the hope that follows that child coming into the world. So uh, full stop preterism just sounds 
erroneous to me because when we're talking about preterism, we're saying there was an expectation that would be like expecting a baby. And then when the baby is born into the world, there's new expectations built on top of that. So uh, nothing has stopped. If anything, now things continue to go on. Uh, then uh, I loved what Joe McDermott had called the full preterist panic. Uh, that's what we're seeing happen here is that now uh, that preterism is being given its opportunity in its heyday, if you will, uh, there's a sort of panic happening in all these different churches and all these different denominational groups. I like to refer to and talk about, of course, the power of preterism, meaning that preterism gives us a foundation, a hermeneutic to better understand the things we read in the Bible. And I hope that that's what we bring forth as we do these podcasts uh, each week. And of course, today, I might mention this, uh, we're not usually live at 1 p.m. We're at 10.30 in the morning, uh, 10.30 a.m. Eastern uh, time uh, type of program. However, today, being that my schedule is a little all over the place, I wanted to go live and at least speak to some of these things that have been happening. And of course, hear from some of my beloved brethren that join with me live. Uh, Brethren, of course, being a term for brothers and sisters uh, that are here with me this morning. Last couple of things I'll bring up that I've been working on and uh, throwing out there for the edification of the masses. Uh, I posted a podcast or a blog, excuse me, called Post Passover Pondering. And uh, we had a beautiful time of Passover at the Blue Point Bible Church. Of course, we celebrate a messianic Passover and uh, we, we shared some food together. We went through a, a Haggadah. Uh, Jewish Haggadah there, learning more about the celebration of Passover. And there was just some really beautiful things about praising God and the sovereignty of God that stood out to me during that time that I shared with you through a pod, uh, blog. So I encourage you to go visit that. I mentioned my sermons I've been preaching through 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, I do believe uh, Joel Sexton. Joel Sexton uh, has continued to be uh, someone that kind of rubs up against the full preterist community. I think for a very brief period of time, he said that he was a full preterist. Uh, maybe he's done that back and forth. Uh, I appreciate his study. I appreciate that he uh, continues to lean in on these things. I know he said that he's going to review some of my First Corinthians 15 uh, sermons and show me where I'm wrong. You know, so uh, I look forward to that. Uh, I encourage any of you that are watching this to reach out to me. Uh, you know, encourage me, rebuke me, whatever it might be. Uh, I welcome it, and uh, you know, I, it helps me, of course, seek, search, study, improve myself. Um, I mentioned the Mark series by Tim Martin, and lastly, I'll just mention this. Tomorrow night, I am going to uh, offer up a, the part 34 of the teaching I've been doing for over a year now, or almost a year, uh, a contextual study through the resurrection or, or the hope of Israel, the resurrection of the dead, and uh, this will be a part 34. We're actually looking at Mark 9, verses 42 through 48, so uh Keep an eye out, join with us, same Zoom session, same call-in number. Uh, I look forward, we'll do that at 7.30 Eastern tomorrow night. And uh, that's where I'm at. As I've mentioned, actually, one, two last things I'll bring up. Um, if you only saw my paper, <laughs> um, Fulfilled Media was supposed to do a conference. Fulfilled Media is run uh, by a man named Preteris Voice. His actual name is Alan Morton. Uh, thank you, Alan, for your efforts. And uh, Alan had put together fulfilledmedia.com and had said that there was going to be a conference in April. April, And unfortunately, there seems to have been um, not, a, not as many people submitting their videos that had signed up. You know, and Alan, he really does put a lot of energy and effort behind these things. So uh, it's Im important for each of us, if we sign up to be a part of this, to uh, definitely contribute. So uh, I was looking forward to being a part of that. However, uh, this it was supposed to be this weekend that the videos were to be released. I believe he's put a hold on that, and we're going to look toward May uh, for the videos to be released. So um, continue to keep an eye out. Visit fulfilledmedia.com. You'll be blessed by the resources that are there, and of course, by what's to come. And uh, Berean Bible Church, hopefully you're uh, watching and ready. Uh, for Berean Bible Church's upcoming conference. We spoke about Gary DeMar. He's one of their guest speakers, and uh, they have a great lineup. Zach Davis, someone else I mentioned before, uh, he will be one of their speakers there at the conference. So visit BereanBibleChurch.org. I believe the conference is uh, next weekend. So it'll be Friday the 28th through the 30th. They usually do stream live. I'm not sure how that's going to work this year. Uh, however, uh, if they're not live, then the videos are always uploaded after the fact. And I hope that we will lean in on that and have some great conversation about their conference, maybe talk with some of the guests of their conference and uh, be blessed in that regard. And I am working on more guests. However, if you remember, our last two guests were 
Daniel Rogers talking about his book, how a 25 year old realized he was not the only one going to heaven. I'm still reading. So I have to, you know, journey further in the book. And then of course we had Pete and Rachel Rue uh, join with us talking about their book, uh, has Jesus Christ returned? I believe uh, was the name of that book. Um, I might have had it wrong. However, Rue W R U E. If you put that in Google, you'll get the exact name of the book. And um, I'm working on reading through that. So, point being, I'm not bringing on other guests until I get that necessary work done, and then we'll be uh, working towards some guests, hopefully from the Berean Bible Church Conference, and then another running list that I have of people that we want to get on our program. So uh, that being said, I'm excited to hear from some of you. We have Edward Howell here who writes the blog, Thinking Through Theology at howell.wordpress.com. We have Dallas Kablaika here with us, of course, from Better Understanding the Bible on YouTube. And then we have Vicki, who is an avid member of the Blue Point Bible Church, as well as Kathy uh, here with us as well. So, uh, and Zach, matter of fact, Zach Cummings is one of our uh, board of directors uh, here for the Power of Preterism Network, uh, along with Edward Howell. So I'm excited to hear what, uh, what thoughts are being had this morning, what resources you might want to bring up for our edification and the edification of those tuned in. So with that, I'll unmute some mics and please jump in. Uh, in an orderly fashion, of course, uh, but contribute to the thoughts that have been already lifted up, please. Edward, I see you're unmuted, brother. You want to jump on in? Jump yeah. in, brother. Jump in the pool. From your message yesterday from uh, 1 Corinthians 15, and you had given me that, uh, that link to Dr. William Bell's uh, take on uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, I had listened to his uh, teaching on of uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 29 through 33, I believe, where it talks about um, else what shall they do which have which are baptized for the dead if the dead ra are, uh, are raised not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? Okay. And then it goes on, you know, to, you know, to 33. And because um, the Mormons believe that you know, those that have passed on that have not been baptized, that you can be baptized for them. That's how they're taking this scripture. But in all actuality, basically, First Corinthians is talking about um, the resurrection of the dead uh, being clarified because they don't believe that the, the dead ones, those that died, you know, before Christ, you know, would be raised and, 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 um, due to the fact that Israel, you know, of old, uh, if they have not been raised, our hope is in vain because the promise was for them. Old covenant uh, promises made the old covenant Israel was for them to be resurrected, restored, you know, brought back into the uh, fellowship and covenant with God to whereas, you know, uh, uh, they would enter God's Sabbath, his rest and be with him forever. Uh, God tabernacling with them and God being uh, their God and uh, and Israel being the, his people. Um, yes, and um, to continue, yeah, that, that was their hope. Um, and Paul is giving them an understanding of of why that he is suffering, you know, going through sufferings, uh, preaching the resurrection of the dead. And why are, you know, they going through all of this if the dead be not raised? You know, it would be a, a, a wasted effort. <laughs> but yet, you know, they're going through this because, you know, Jesus being the first fruits of, of the dead, of, of, uh, of the dead ones, um, to demonstrate that the dead will be raised. Um, that's the spiritual aspect because everyone knows about, about the physical aspect of Jesus being raised. He wasn't the first to be raised because a lot of people were raised at, back at that time. So the significance of the spiritual aspect of you know, Jesus being raised you know, to demonstrate that the dead ones would be raised and that's uh, the hope of Israel. You know, so... Um, the importance of the dead being raised is that that is our hope.
because that was promised to them. And if God did not fulfill his promise to them, what makes us think that he would fulfill the promises that's made to us as far as, you know, all the blessings and things that are promised to us as a result of believing in Christ, you know? So God, you know, is faithful. He has, you know, fulfilled his promise to them, which, um, um, gives our promise of all the blessings that Jesus has promised us to be, you know, solidified. Amen. If I might just follow up with that, I would say, um, as uh, Dave Curtis, Pastor Dave Curtis said, he said, for the dead ones, resurrection was the hope, right? And for us, life is the hope. So let's look at that. If Christ has not provided resurrection to the dead ones, if there was not to be resurrection of the dead ones, which was the argument there in Corinth, then how can we trust Christ to be our life? He said that he would give us life to the full. Well, that sounds good, uh, or that he gave everything to us pertaining to life and godliness. Well, that sounds good as well. But if, I, if you did not provide the promise to the people you promised to initially, showed yourself faithful to that promise, which did have time stamps and, and those things attached to it, then I'm, my, my understanding of Jesus being the life uh, and giving me life to the full uh, could be faulty or problematic. So yeah, I appreciate what you said there, Edward. And I'm glad that uh, I will mention the link. I'll, I'll provide the link for uh, Dr. William Bell's teaching on the baptism of suffering is basically what he was outlining there. Uh, yeah. that, you know, we're being, su- we're being baptized in suffering uh, for a hope that you're saying is not going to happen or, or that you know, uh, is not going to be established yet God promised it. So that was a big, conundrum for the Corinthian church. And uh, yes, so I'm glad you're getting edification from what I'm sharing as well as what Dr. Bell had shared. And uh, obviously that's a topic we continue to lean in on, on Tuesday nights and a host of other places. So. Yes. And last thought with the baptism of suffering in Mark uh, and in Matthew, how it speaks of the two uh, James and John that wanted to sit on either side of Jesus. And he asked them, could they take the cup that he's drinking of? or the baptism in which he would be baptized of, which was the baptism of suffering. Mm -hmm. And they said, yes, and they did suffer, you know, that baptism, you know, of the suffering. So uh, uh, according to William Bell, that suffering that Jesus suffered uh, had qualified him to be the first fruit from the dead. Uh, Amen, well said. I I will... uh... You know, I also mentioned, I know you've been leaning in on the Gary DeMar podcast as well. Uh, so they're leaning in on that topic of resurrection as we journey further. You're kind of right where I am, like part three. But as we journey further in listening to their podcast, they're going to get into this sort of resurrection topic. So I look forward to developing those thoughts with you as we follow along. Yes, thank you. Good deal. Thank you, brother. And by the way, we do look forward to that blog. I'll be uh, posting that blog response that you have. Uh, in days tomorrow by tomorrow so thank you Dallas I see you're unmuted you want to jump in here yeah I'll just do a quick response to that uh, idea with the resurrection one thing that I never hear anyone really bring up is that other people raise people from the dead Jesus sent out his disciples to raise people from the dead so why is Jesus's resurrection so different So I never hear people argue because obviously they were raising people from the dead. So that's a fulfillment of you will see the physical dead raised as a sign because of what's the difference then? Otherwise, Jesus's resurrection is absolutely meaningless. Why? Because he wasn't even the one doing it. His disciples were. So why do we follow Jesus? Why don't we follow his disciples who raised the dead? Why aren't they the light of life? What makes Jesus so different? than those resurrectors Mm -hmm. so i think that never gets you know cut apart to see why jesus's resurrection was so different from him giving it that power freely to other people Hmm. so i I don't really have too much to comment on i just as you guys are speaking about it i was like hmm you know i've never heard anyone parallel the fact that his other that his apostles not not even his apostles the disciples so the (laughs) if we want to put a rank in order to it right we have jesus then you have your apostles so even the lowly disciples were out there raising the dead so it's very interesting language (laughs) in in jesus's name the power was in the name of jesus 
Amen. That, that was their, their uh, we see in Ephesians 1, matter of fact, uh, Dallas, I, I'd encourage you to check out the sermon. You might be encouraged by uh, some of the things I shared, where we see in Ephesians 1 that, yes, the power that raised Christ from the dead, the power of God that Jesus had already previously told that generation they didn't understand, uh, that power uh, that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that was given to the church, to the disciples, to the apostles. So, uh, yeah, I do think there's a an interesting discussion that needs to be had as to, and again, I think Paul's leaning in on that in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, where he's establishing that Christ was the firstborn from among the dead ones. Jesus's resurrection was far different uh, in spirituality and what it meant for uh, spiritual things than any resurrection that was ever mentioned or dealt with in the Bible. So, yeah, see, like I'll put forward the question, when his disciples went out raising people from the dead, were they bringing people up from the dirt or were they converting them to the new covenant? Hmm. So I'll leave that battle because did they go and pull people out of graves or did they go and lift people up into new heights hmm. up into the heavenlies? I might say both. Uh, you know, I, I don't, again, I don't see, I think that if Jesus raised somebody or his disciples raised somebody from the physical dead, let's face it. They physically died again. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure there was somebody walking around that, uh, I don't, um, you, you know, so that wasn't the efficacy of the resurrection of the dead that we're talking about, or that Paul was talking about in first Corinthians 15, where I would say those that are resurrected in Christ die no more. That's the resurrection we're talking about, not the, uh, you know, your body can come out, you know, you, the zombie apocalypse, which I know people have mocked me for talking about that, but that's what it sounds like is the zombie apocalypse. If we obsess over this uh, physical resurrection reality. So, yeah. Uh, I, I think that's what's really neat about that language is because if you're going to sit here and say there's a future bodily resurrection for every living human being, uh, if you're of that mind, maybe you might want to go and look at those things because, you yeah. know, it, it might just not be as straightforward as it sounds because like if you and me, I believe, and I might be put on the cross for this, but I believe you and I are raising the dead. Amen. We are. You're absolutely correct. That's that's also why I tell people, you know, there's times where I find myself, even with uh, my five year old stepson, where I'll say I'll never die. Uh, and, you know, everybody's like, what? And I'm like, well, I won't. I will never die. I have Jesus. Jesus said, those who believe in me shall never die. Uh, so then people obviously it brings up a secondary question. Well, do you believe you will physically die? I say, of course. But now what we've just done is we've shown there's a distinction between resurrection of the dead or resurrection in general and resurrection from bodily or physical death. Uh, there's these differences that need to be detailed and talked about. So, and they're right there in our new Testament. It's not something we're making up. Those distinctions are there. Yeah. That's if you're a futurist or a future resurrectionist, that's a hot matzo ball. You're going to have to juggle for a while. Absolutely. <laughs> hot matzo balls. Oh man, that's a recipe. I to try. <laughs> uh, I got to work on that one. That's a good one. Uh, Dallas, so if you don't mind, uh, while I got you here, uh, anything been uh, on your mind, your heart, you're working on anything uh, lately? Uh, you bet. Before I jump in, though, I, I do notice that Zach unmuted. So before I take into that, uh, did you want to say something, Zach? Zach, good morning, brother. Hey, good morning. Um, thank you. I, I don't have all that much. I just, I first of all, I'd like to, you know, congratulate you, Michael and Rashonda, and we're... Um, thankful for the blessing of new baby and um, definitely be praying for you and um, thanking God for, for how he's blessing you all. Thank you, brother. Um, yeah, I, with the whole mind dump thing, I direct people again back to new heavens and new earth unveiled hmm. with Jeremy Stoltz. He continues to do his um, response to the, um, unorthodox eschatology hyperpreterism.com um, statement um, continues to work on that and it's been blessed very by it it's very valuable um, he also in his latest um, video discusses the Don Preston debate with this atheist gentleman um, uh, everybody should go and you know look and see what he has to say with that. I'll I'll give a little bit of a uh, summation of that. Um, yeah, there was a big uh, issue that he had with 
um, what on, went on with that debate, and I think this is, you know, pretty telling, is that there was a lot of people in the comments and uh, asking questions who were uh, perhaps partial preterists or probably better put anti-full preterists who were intent on uh, attacking Don Preston and uh, trying to make him look, uh, I guess, stupid, you may say. Um, and it's just uh, it's just a reflection on you know the extent to which people can be um, possessed ideologically by sort of these things and can uh, not act wisely when it comes to dis disagreements within the body. Um, this was Don Preston is a Christian man, a, a man who believes in. Christ and the um, and Christ's words, and you have Christians seeking to undermine him in his debate against an atheist, and it, it was just a sort of it, it was an unpleasant display to say the least about what went on, and I think it's something that needs to be be called out, especially in this the environment we seem to find ourselves in in the recent months with the whole Gary DeMar thing. It's it's just, it's, you know, it's, uh, what else can be said? I mean, people should really think about <laughs> where their heart is when they take that tact um, to a debate like this. Um, so anyway, I would, I would recommend people go for a more thorough discussion of this go to New Heavens and New Earth Unveiled in its latest video. Um, also, you know, going back to what you said about Doug Wilson, I, we've talked about this before, and I think, but we continue to see it happening. This rhetoric of, you know, accusing full preterists of being fanatical for simply defending themselves and simultaneously requiring full preterists to defend themselves. Um, yeah, and, and this type of thing, what Doug Wilson is talking about and what's going on with Gary DeMar, this is, this is not people earnestly searching the scriptures to see what's true. This is an interrogation. Um, and, you know, I think we should, um, see the wisdom in what Gary DeMar is doing. We shouldn't be submitting to these interrogations or playing these types of games. And, you know, I'm, I am a little bit surprised that we continue to see it and we continue to see these types of games being proliferating and the way that people are approaching full preterism. I mean, I think it's, frankly, I think it's, it's telling and revealing in a spiritual sense about you know, where some of these people's hearts are when they're uh, approaching full preterism and the word of God. And I, uh, again, I, I'm, I'm thankful for how Gary DeMar has handled this. And yeah, I would recommend his, his recent uh, podcast. He continues to work with Kim Burgess on, um, on tackling these issues in a mature way. We might not always agree with them on these things, but at least they're having the conversation and attempting to undertake a mature um, uh, exegesis and analysis of scripture and really searching to see whether these things are true from scripture. And so, I mean, I, I would, I guess so those would be my two <laughs> recommendations, uh, New Heaven and New Earth Unveiled uh, with Jeremy Stoltz and uh, uh, Covenant Hermeneutics and Biblical Eschatology with uh, Gary DeMar and Kim Burgess. Yeah, Zach, I appreciate you bringing that up. If I might just say uh, something there, you know, the recent events with Gary and Kim Burgess and, and uh, their mannerisms, the way they talk about things, uh, even Kim reaching out to me and having some dialogue with me has caused me to learn some things. For example, I can tend to be sort of uh, 
bullyish to borrow to make up a word maybe uh you know where uh, in my mannerisms of talking with people and, and wanting people to see things my way which sometimes i believe is the right way uh however uh I've learned to take a step back and appreciate where people are at. And I know, yes, as you mentioned, Zach, you and I have shared some conversation in this regard. And, uh, you know, it's, it's caused me to, and this is what I, I would hope biblical truth does for all of us or in, in these type of situations would cause us to examine ourselves and see, uh, you know, how can I grow through this? And, and I have to say, uh, listening to Kim and, you know, I, I sort of obsess. So I've listened to the first three podcasts probably about 15 times, uh, you know, and uh, just wanting to really catalog their thought, dare I say, you know, writing notes and quoting uh, different things that they're saying to make my point. I am actually appreciative. I have to mention, uh, I heard that they're going to be publishing a book, a transcript version of those podcasts. So uh, there's a way you could support American Vision for that. Uh, that seems like a neat idea. And um, what it's caused me to do is take a step back and more recently, I found myself really, I reached out to uh, Kim Burgess actually during Holy Week and told him that one of his thoughts he shared uh, that there's uh, many, one of the many, I believe is the phrase he kept using in one of the podcasts uh, that, you know, when we're talking about this, we have to allow all the pieces to kind of come together. You know, if you remember the part two of their podcast was about dissection and vivisection, uh, you know, keeping the frog alive while understanding what's going on rather than killing the frog and laying everything out what systematic theology seems to do. Um, I've really come to appreciate what they're doing. While I might not always agree with all the ins and outs, I appreciate the hermeneutic of saying, let's investigate the Bible all the while trying to pull all the pieces of the Bible together. Uh, how does this you know, help us understand different parts? And that's what they're doing. You, you know, At the end of the day, they're not trying to be actually, if I might say it like this, uh, there tends, there's a, we talk about exegesis a lot. And exegesis is, are those folks that are saying, now that I've done the work, I've done the, you know, biblical theology, this is where I have arrived, exegesis. But most folks don't know how to do the middle of going from, you know, we know most Christians do, uh, we call it eisegeting, right? They impose their perspective on the scripture, which sometimes is right and many times is wrong. Uh, let's face it, you could open up the Bible, have a certain view, and you might be able to find that view expressed through biblical teaching, and it might be right. However, what most folks have a problem doing is learning how to move from eisegeting to exegeting. Uh, and what is the middle? The middle is what Kim Burgess and Gary DeMar are doing, biblical theology, where you're, you're, you know, you're studying through these things. You're not coming out right away and saying, this is what it must mean. You're taking your time. You're developing other thoughts, pulling in other pieces and slowly methodically going through that. So uh, that's something that's really caused me to pause and appreciate what they're doing because I see that they're, they're trying to bring in a, a middle view of biblical theology and not, not positing it as a view, but saying this is where we need to spend some time in learning how to do biblical theology. And uh, that, you know, uh, Zach, you've actually played a larger part than you might realize just in you and I talking and maybe you're not saying it, but me interpreting your words as saying, Mike, relax, listen, be patient. And I think we all really need to uh, clamor for that type of hermeneutic uh, that, you know, give people time, give people space to develop these things. Just because you heard it here on the Preterist Power Hour doesn't mean that all, uh, what, seven of us here are saying, this is what we believe. No, we're bringing up thoughts, we're detailing them, uh, and we're, we're studying through them. And hopefully we can give each other space. I just read a quote from Andy Stanley a couple of years ago, where he said the church, and I believe what we're doing here is church, uh, the church should be the safest place for students to think through all things. And I hope that we just see more of those mannerisms. That's what I'm getting from Gary and Kim. And uh, so, you know, I want to encourage folks as well, review those resources. Zach, thank you for bringing them up and highlighting, you know, that highlighting what they're doing with such grace. And of course, uh, I do look forward to uh, reaching out to uh, Jeremy and uh, we'll be having him in him on our program soon as well. So I look forward to uh, reviewing some of his thoughts pertaining to these things as well. Great, thanks and bless you all. Hey, bless you brother. And we'll be in touch. I know you and I, we, uh, we have to do some fellowship. I know the board of the Power of Preterism Network has some uh, overdue uh, meeting time. So we'll be working on that in the next few weeks, okay? Amen. Brother, thank you.
Yeah, yeah. I'll respond also to uh, that interview between Donkey Preston and uh, Mark Smith. Uh, I don't really call it a debate because it really wasn't one. What we ended up seeing, and I'm going to speak more specifically to what Zach did because the debate, you know, unfortunately, it, it, it wasn't even close to a debate. And unfortunately, you're not going to go to that that interaction and you're going to learn a lot of doctrinal any kind of thing that way uh, but what i think uh, zach focused on was a really big tell in the community of the body and unfortunately we've entered into this situation where the the body is at war with itself and i i think the core of it is coming down to we're more wanting to be right than we do want to know the truth so people are coring into there. They're just holding on for all they can do, you know, everything they can be to that doctrine, whether it's true or not, because they need to be right. And I think we see a big move in the culture in general becoming very uh, Greek in the it's A or B. There's no conversation. So that's polarizing that and it's moved into the church as well. And so what we're seeing is this division in the body, but not based upon even really doctrine, because we can't get to the doctrine because we're too worried about being wrong so unfortunately i think that's what that debate showed was in that comment section futurists and partial preterists should not be siding with atheists and i'm not saying that just because i'm a christian you should agree with me i mean we should be of one body sure we might have different ideas but the thing is, we're not one body. We're divided by being right and wrong. So I, I want to thank Zach for bringing that up because I think that debate really highlighted that issue in the body. And it's important to understand because, and this moves into my mind dump, uh, moving into my book studies. Uh, I See, I have come to really enjoy tearing apart and looking at the Bible again anew from the covenant creation point of view. And that study is expanding me. Well, I can't at the same time pour into the stuff that Don K. Preston is pouring into. And in fact, Don K. Preston finds it very difficult to go away from the stuff he's into to come into the stuff I'm into. Well, that's because we're one man each. So it's actually impossible for the body to learn from one man each because one man is one view. We need the whole body to stop fighting and coming together because if we have the whole body, we can get the whole view. So I think that's something that's really come out and I found interesting because going through my studies into the book that I'm definitely uh, being, it's constantly growing the idea behind it, but it's really limiting me on the ability to look into other things. So now I have to trust other people and then rely upon them to do good work. So I think that's one thing that, uh, I've come to really appreciate from uh, not only this group and that because they, fo they they open those doors, but, but even just self-study, the willingness to be wrong, the willing to give grace, which I think uh, if anybody's been watching this channel for any time period uh, realizes that's the issue is the lack of grace. Like uh, Mike, Ed, Zach, all the people here, like as much as we are preterists or full preterists, whatever you want to label us, we don't all believe the same. In fact, me and Mike probably disagree on a lot of very core doctrinal points, but you don't see us fighting about it because that's not the issue. The issue is spirit first, love each other first, put that other person before you, then you can figure out all that other stuff. So it's very interesting that that became part of this conversation because uh, as I was going through my studies this week, that was something that jumped out at me is we have to love the members of the body even if we disagree with them because what they're fishing out is the stuff you aren't and now you have questions about what they're finding well that's great because you weren't looking there anyway so that's a very fascinating thing uh speaking of which moving into that uh video that i've put up recently that if anybody hasn't checked out uh i know edward has gone and taken a look at it and he's giving me some great comments on it is the satan video i put up dealing with the serpent satan and the devil who they are in the bible from start to finish and then uh now i'm working on the new covenant template and that's actually been a really interesting accidental study because when i started the idea of the covenant uh template book 
I was not even thinking about going into the New Testament. It was never part of my ideas, but it's funny how God decides what you're going to do sometimes. And so that's opened such a whole new can of worms, and that's what I'm pouring into. And uh, as I've written down here, I've accidentally uh, established a lot of uh, controversial contexts to uh, a lot of doctrines. And that's what's so neat about the, <laughs> the ebb and flow of this conversation is I've had to uh, be okay with uprooting even some of my own personal doctrines in this past week with some of the stuff I'm finding. So it's really interesting, uh, just that flavor. of, And I guess that's my theme. My mind dump is the willingness to be wrong and letting it be okay and surfing through that darkness and confusion and not hating someone for it. So that's where I'm kind of going at it. Uh, I will throw that out there again. Go to Better Understanding the Bible. Check out uh, The Serpents, The Satan, and The Devil. That's up. That should challenge a lot of people. Uh, I, I wouldn't mind uh, if Edward would expound on what he thought about it, give a, a non-biased opinion, because <laughs> I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> and then uh, on top of that, I'm getting close now. Now that with this new covenant template idea, I now have... Uh, in my mind what i'm doing for the book it's i have the start the middle the finish concept uh right now i have for the name you guys can critique it tell me it's crazy it doesn't make sense please rip it apart so i know if i should use parts of the components in this or not whatever be grateful but what i'm going to uh, call it is the covenant template the biblical primer so that's what i'm looking at for my book and I, i'm just going to leave this to ed now see you you know if you would share on that video i'd appreciate it Sure. Um, I got a lot out of that video of the, uh, the uh, Satan, the serpent, and the devil, um, because they all represent um, adversary, adversarial aspects. Um, then you have, um, you know, because it's always, you know, a people, it can be a, a nation as an army, it can be, you know, various things. And, and the important things that I had gotten out of it was context. Because it's not always, you know, a negative thing. Um, uh, yes, it's, you know, it's adversarial. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's the things of man sometimes instead of the things of God, you know, and you have given quite a few scripture of you know how it can be Peter, how it can be you know the Pharisees, Sadducees, or you know the the, the high priests. You know it. You know uh, it can be um, Israel, uh, and then Israel being punished by another Satan because of their idolatrous behaviors. It's all of these things. You know uh, context is very important, and you know. Basically, you know, is adversarial, you know. The one that really jumped out at me when I was making that video, and I'd like to see how you took it, was when I took a look at Solomon and Solomon's fall. God raised up an adversary, a Satan, the 784, this, the, uh, what the Bible translates as the superhuman enemy of God, that exact word, God raised that up against Solomon and one man, an Edomite, then another man, and then even his, uh, one of his high servants turned and rebelled. So God literally created a satanic movement against Solomon. That doesn't sound right to Christians, but that's what the scriptures say straightforward. So I was wondering what your uh, view, because a lot of people have never seen that. Have you seen that before? Well, basically Solomon like brought it on himself because God had warned him about marrying uh, the different women because they would take him away from God and have him worship other gods. And being that he was, you know, stubborn and he went and did it anyway, he felt just as God told him he would. So God had to, you know, respond accordingly. <laughs> Absolutely. And when you change that word, isn't it interesting how with Solomon, because I agree with you, he broke the covenant, therefore he was liable to the repercussions. So within the repercussions, it says, I'm going to raise up this adversary to you. Well, it's literally the word Satan. So if we were to misrepresent that word today, it's interesting how we think there's satanic movements. Well, if we look at Solomon, 
wasn't that a satanic movement? It was the Satans rising up against uh, Solomon at Amen. the behest of God. Amen. So I just thought found that was a pretty interesting video, and I'm really glad that you watched it. And uh, the comments you gave me in our private chat was really awesome and encouraging. So uh, I would just like to recommend, you know, that was part of my week. Uh, if you got, it's been up for a little while. If you haven't seen it, it's very, very challenging. If you haven't looked at what Satan actually is in the Bible, and there's a lot. And unfortunately, even the you know great teachers. This was one of my earlier points about how we're we're all focused on certain things. Uh, you know, I love Don K. Preston. I have no negatives to say whatsoever about him, but it seems to me, and I've never looked deep into his view on it, that he believes in an actual say, Satan. So, like from a classical point of view, mystical character. So, why then, if I, from my perspective, who thinks differently, should I use that one disagreement to discount everything that Don says? Well, I'd be foolish because Don's an amazing scholar. He's an amazing workhorse, but in disagreements on one topic. So this is why I think we need the whole body working together, because I think uh, if anyone were to take two minutes honestly and go through my video and then follow up on their own, they would never, ever, ever, ever even be able to conceptualize some spiritual being at war with humanity. And that is a predominant view, even amongst full preterism. So we need the whole body at work. I appreciate you, Ed, for taking the time and going through that and all those that have. And if you haven't, please check it out. It'll challenge you. Uh, it'll change the way you see things. And, you know, there you go. There's my mind dump, guys. <laughs> I look forward to checking it out. Uh, yeah, I appreciate both of you uh, sharing some thoughts. Uh, I've obviously written a bit about Satan myself and have some views. It sounds like we're running along a similar vein of uh allowing the Bible to say what the Bible says about Satan rather than all the mythology and everything else that's been added to it. Uh, and actually becomes quite an easy, clean study when you, you just take the time to go through the references, uh, even in places that it's a little more hidden than uh, others uh, and allowing, you, you know, just because it means something here doesn't mean that I have to necessarily carry that context over to the other context, but I can allow each context to mean what it's saying. Uh, we know the word means adversary. However, there's a variety of adversaries revealed throughout the Bible. So, uh, you know, just taking the time is very beneficial. So I'm going to make my way over there. It's on my list uh, to, you know, journey with you in that and uh, hear what you have to say. So, yeah, that sounds exciting to me. It's a fun study, right? Once you start realizing weird things, like you've been afraid of the devil your whole life, but he's not mentioned once in the entire Old Testament. That's a pretty interesting statement to have to juggle. Why yeah. wasn't the why didn't the Hebrews have to deal with the devil <laughs> or demons? You have a hard time finding demons in the Old Testament, you know. So, uh, yeah, there's the, I I really look forward to it. I'll check it out. And I also wanted to uh, second what it seems to be uh, our our vein of thought today, or even maybe the last couple of weeks, is the wisdom from above. And I'm going to read us that text here from James three uh, because that's what we're actually saying here. We're talking about. Uh, you know, being peaceable, being gentle in our understandings, appreciating one another, the differences, the perspectives that are being added. Uh, as I mentioned to uh, Kim Burgess, I said, well, in the Jewish understanding, the Jewish worldview, they used to allow rabbis to kind of bring up multitude of things. You'd have like four or five rabbis, you know, speak to one thing, and each of them seemed to go in a different direction. Because we know, you know, just in this room of us seven, if we bring up a topic, sometimes our minds go, we, you know, we use some of our preconceived notions, we use past experience, different studies, each of us have different ways and mannerisms of study, topics that pique our interest. So yes, it's so important to allow a mosaic of truth to be revealed, rather than, you know, just the sort of one, you know, monologue of, uh, that's one, you know, frustrating thing the church has done is we've made preachers where you know now all of a sudden the pastor preacher is the know-it-all and everybody else in the congregation is just regurgitating what he's saying uh that that should not be it you know i'm glad to say that i pastor a congregation that many of these folks are far more seasoned in biblical reading than me so uh it, it doesn't it gives me opportunity not to be a know-it-all uh to appreciate the, the mixture and yeah there's going to be times where i might say yeah i wouldn't say that like that or I might not agree with that particular point. However, we're able to appreciate the perspectives. And I hope I'm not the only one here that, you know, I might have called something wrong 10 years ago. Uh, then so all of a sudden, because of some new things I studied, I went back and I said, wait a minute, that might have been right. 
I was wrong. You know, that it sounds like that's what you've been doing, Dallas. And that's encouraging because that's what seeking, searching, studying, and proving, which again, proving means there's going to be times where hopefully you're proving yourself wrong. Um, you know, that we should be doing that. So it sounds like God's uh, on the move and, uh, you know, doing some work in our lives. Well, I'll tell you, if you ever want to challenge your beliefs, write a book. Yeah, that's right. Because like, I'll tell you, if you think you want to be right, sit down and prove it. That's right. There's a difference between having an opinion and having an assertion and having biblically, biblically established narrative equipped. I think that's the big one. People always have these awesome, cool theories and ideas. But they never sit with the narrative. You know, get your, uh, what do they call, uh, oh, for systematic theology figured out mm -hmm. and show me point A, B, C. Don't tell me how you, you know, the answer you came to. Show me how you arrived there. That will change everything because it has for me unfortunately for covenant creation the bible's a brand new book and i love it and that caused me to have to throw away like just discard what i once loved but it's so interesting because now here's where i think the battle isn't a battle because that which i once loved is now a dirty filthy rag compared to what i've been received and then that gives me way. And it's crazy because the very first time I came to God, I thought I received all things. <laughs> so like, it, it's a refreshing reminder of how little we know and how humbling it is because I've read everything that I'm finding anew a million times already. Yeah, well said. You know, again, it, it just demonstrates the humility in our study and the honesty that we endeavor toward. And I, I pray that for each of us, of course, um, I am going to move us toward a close. I, I did want to uh, make sure I give Kathy and Vicky opportunity. Uh, both of you have opportunity to unmute your mic if you'd like to jump in and share a thought with us. Uh, of course, uh, as I close out our program, I do want to remind you later today, I'm going to post a, a blog on powerofpreterism.wordpress.com where I'm going to provide a host of these resources because you might be like me right now saying, oh my gosh, these guys are throwing a lot of stuff uh, out there. Uh, we'll provide links and encourage you to do some study. And if you need a place, a forum to get those thoughts out, consider joining with us live on Mondays and Fridays at 1030 AM. So um, there was something that was said that I wanted to respond to, but now I'm forgetting my thought. Um, you know, I, I really do. I appreciate what we're doing here. And, and I will say this, um, actually show your work. There it was. Gary DeMar and Kim have been saying that, right? Show your work. Uh, you remember when you were in school, they demanded that, you know, you, just so you know, you weren't peeking over and cheating uh, the person next to you, uh, your teachers, at least that's what I thought they were doing it for. Now I know they were actually just trying to make sure I also knew how to learn. Um, but, uh, you, you know, the, matter of fact, that works. That works in what we're talking about here. Don't peek over at the other person's answers. Do the seeking, searching, studying, improving yourself. Show us that you're doing this biblical theology that, uh, you know, Kim Burgess and Gary have been talking about. Uh, you know, this is what study to show yourself approved, rightly dividing the word of truth. The man, the woman who does so need not be ashamed. This is what that means, uh, is taking the time. Uh, the other thing I'll mention, uh, just that talking about covenant creation, and obviously it's always something, you know, preterism and covenant creation are always sort of in my, uh, my toolbox here as I read through the Bible. Uh, I've been very encouraged this past week. So many of you know, I, I welcomed my daughter, Kalani, and uh, the name actually, the, we, we came up with a bunch of K names because we want to keep the K, uh, we have Caden, and now we have Kalani, we wanted to keep K alive in our family. So we even did a little vote at the Blue Point Bible Church, allowed everybody to participate uh, in the names. Then we, um, we really prayed about it and felt convicted. And it just so happened, we were talking about covenant creation at that time. And as one day when I started plugging into Google, you know, what does this name mean? What does this name mean? I came across Kalani, meaning waters in the heavens. And I was like, oh, gosh, that's a Genesis 1 conversation. And, uh, you know, so I was convicted and I named my daughter Kalani. You know, we confirmed it based on that. So, uh, you know, and Dallas, believe it or not, I actually bring you up in most conversations because I say it was, you know, talking with you and listening to some of your videos, the covenant template that really helped me. Uh, you know, have conviction in that regard. So I thank you. And then get this. So this week, my wife and I, you know, we're in the hospital, we're talking and just doing reading and talking. And I talk a lot, folks, if you haven't noticed. So um, there we are. And, you know, we're talking about the name Kalani and I put in Caden. And sure enough, Caden has correlation 
to Adam. I mean, get this, it's going to get wild. So, uh, you know, Caden has correlation to Adam and ground. Then you have Rashonda. So I look up Rashonda's name and sure enough, Rashonda means creation. And I'm like, oh my God, I mean, talk about getting the chills. And uh, so then Rashonda means creation. And my name, many know Michael is mentioned in the Bible, he who is like God. So I started pulling these names together and I'm like, we literally have a Genesis one story in our family that we need to get, you know, we need to talk about this. And uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, Dallas, you'll be hearing more about this from me. I really want to uh, write something that puts some of my covenant creation thoughts and perspectives and leanings uh, on paper and in a book. And, uh, you know, it'll be a great tribute to my family, to my daughter, of course. And I think a great tribute to our time together, as all of us have really been urging each other to lean in on Genesis 1 through 3 and uh, get a good understanding of it. And I stand on the shoulders of giants. I call, uh, you know, Tim Martin, Jeff Vaughn, uh, yourself, Dallas, and, and quite a few other names that might, now, might not be coming to mind right now. I call them my Genesis giants. And, uh, you know, I truly stand upon the shoulders of giants. So uh, hopefully that's what you get out of what we do here, is that we have so many resources and opportunities to, you know, one day the person might seem like a giant, the next day they might be standing on your shoulders, uh, you know, peering into things like we just talked about with Don Preston. Uh, it's funny, I, I always boast about this, I brag a bit. I had Don Preston in my car for about 50 minutes, a 50 minute car ride from my house to the airport. And imagine what that conversation was like. You know, I know what he believes about AD 70. I know what he believes about the resurrection of the dead. Don, I need to know what you believe about covenant creation. I need to know what you believe about hell. I need to know what you believe about Satan. And, uh, you know, what I appreciate about Don is he talks about what he knows he should talk about. He's not a put a foot in his mouth type of person. So he's not going to let you do that. You know, he's going to kind of say what he knows, say what he's studied and dealt with and kind of leave the rest to a mystery. And uh, he, unfortunately, I have to say he did that to me. Uh, let me know that he didn't quite look into it. And um, I know he's been much more open in maybe the last year. Uh regarding uh, covenant creation. So uh, yes, and that's right, Dallas, we each have our call and we, we appreciate Don for what he does and what he brings to the table. And um, yeah, you know, and I appreciate each of you. So uh, thank you for being here this morning. And I know I had mentioned Kathy and Vicki, I didn't see them on mute. I'm very appreciative of both of you. Vicki, if you only knew coming up to me after the sermon yesterday and saying that you understood each thing I said, uh, it, it carried with me throughout the weekend. So thank you. Thank you all again for just being an encouragement uh, in these regards. Uh, in closing this morning, I want to encourage you to keep an eye out for the, the blogs. And also, if you're on our email, uh, you know, keep an eye out for times that I might cancel. I'm still working on my schedule and how this might work together. Right now, we're still planning Friday at 1030 a.m. We should be here. And um, keep it, if you're not on the email list, email me. Pastor Mike Miano at yahoo.com, Christianity Gone Wild at yahoo.com, Miano Gone Wild at yahoo.com. Those are all my emails. I have a host of them. I have but 10 others I can tell you right now. Uh, but those are my three that I use the most. Email me. Let me know you want to be notified about the, the, the details, excuse me, of the Power of Preterism Network. And I'll make sure I keep you on our email list if there's cancellations, because we do have a great following online that might not zoom in or call in, but they are following us on Facebook or YouTube, and I'm very appreciative to that. Uh, in closing this morning, I just want to go ahead and uh, share some Missional Monday thoughts. I believe, well, hopefully everything we said so far gave you a little bit of a mission. You got some resources you got to look into and some things you have to learn and some, dare I say, uh, wisdom from above to appreciate. However, in looking at some posts I shared years ago, I felt convicted to share this with you. Uh, the first would be a quote from Stanley Harawas. Most of us are uh, familiar with that name, uh, you know, theologian from, uh, you know, a, a powerful theologian, we'll say that. Uh, he said this, and I think this should encourage all of us. The problem is not belief in the resurrection, but whether we live lives that would make no sense if in fact Jesus had not been raised from the dead. Does that not compel us this morning? It's not all about the doctrines and what we believe about resurrection of the dead and what we don't believe about resurrection of the dead, but rather the life that we're living in light of our understanding of the resurrection of the dead. I wanna ask you this morning, in light of what you've come to know about the resurrection of the dead, about the, um, you know, about the resurrection of the dead, about uh, the resurrection of the dead ones, about Bible prophecy, about whatever it is, does it lead you to this? James chapter 3, verse 17 through 18. 
But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteous is sown in peace by those who make peace. Is your view leading you in that? What you've come to know about the resurrection, the resurrection of the dead, Bible prophecy, covenant creation, the beginning of Genesis? Or is your Bible causing you to be someone that does something like this? Well, that's what the Bible says, and that's it. If that's, that's not reasonable, that's not the wisdom that's from above. That's not what we as Christians are called to walk in. So, and as I've mentioned, preterism would mean nothing to me if I wasn't a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ. So I hope and pray that what we've done this morning, yeah, we've given a lot of information. We talked about a lot of great stuff. But I want to encourage you to seek after that wisdom that is from above. Seek after the mannerisms that the wisdom from above would display. And ask yourself as you're learning and journeying through this, what, what is it causing? And again, you might want to read a couple verses up. And then if you read a couple verses up, you'll read about the wisdom that is from here, natural. And ask yourself, is your hermeneutic causing you to be more natural? Or is it causing you to be more spiritual, born from above? No man will see God unless he is born from above. Thank you for being here this morning. I pray that our time was encouraging to you. I pray that that makes you have a missional Monday. And right in line with what uh, we've talked about this morning, find your purpose in him. Find your convictions in God. Find the things in scripture that convict you and get you excited and give you the chills and make you the hair on your arm stand up as mine is right now. Do that. Make that your missional Monday. Find your purpose in him. Find your convictions in him and live out that purpose and those convictions. That way you will bring glory to God. Thank you for being here with us this morning. I'm going to go ahead and unmute Edward. And Edward, if I might ask you to just close us in a word of prayer. I thank you, brother, for being here this morning. And of course, I thank all of you. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together in this prayer power hour. Prayerfully, we were able to uh, bring forth uh, clarity, healing, and strategy, you know, that for the use of the knowledge of God, uh, I pray that we've all been edified and strengthened, iron sharpening iron with all our different uh, views and ideas. And uh, I, I pray for those that are listening today that not only have they been edified and strengthened and encouraged, but are he being healed uh, of any manner of sickness, uh, uh, mental exhaustion, uh, stress, or anything, COVID or whatever that may be ailing anyone, that they will be healed and encouraged and strengthened uh, for those that are taking care of those that may be ill. And uh, I just pray for strength and God to continue to show, you know, your mighty deeds and acts, you know, uh, throughout our lives. You know, thank you for being that consistent and faithful God and loving us and uh, uh, dwelling among us and you being our God and us being your people. You know, bless, our, bless the church as you have been and uh, continue to, uh, advance the full preterist uh, movement and uh, just continue to just give us that zeal and power by knowledge in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Yes, Lord. Let it be all of you and all for you. Amen. Thank you all for being here. God bless. Go in peace. God willing. I'll see you on Friday at 1030 a.m. Eastern that is. Take care.